directions of how to do it from the state. Um, try to remember when you're speaking to uh, give your name before you go ahead and speak. Um, so let's start with the roll call. John Goodwin, I am here. Jean Grzlecki? Here. Uh, do we get Jackson in yet? No, he's not in yet. Jackson, no. Dan Radman, you still there? I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, Ken Turner? Here. Okay, Dick Ward, do we have Dick? No, he's not here. Okay, he's a no. Uh, Krista Nielsen? Here. Okay. Claire Tiscornia is not joining us tonight. Phil Williams? I'm here. Okay, perfect. Um, Phil, you are seated for an open position on the commission. And Krista, you are seated for Bill Redman, who is technically still a member of the commission until uh, tomorrow or the day after. Um, and that is all I have on the announcement side. So let's get going with the public hearing. Item number one, 635 Frogtown Road. Upon application, Stephen Finn, Wolvesy Road, and Kweskin Kuriansky, authorized agent for New Canaan Country School owners for special permit modification approval of sections A2B6D to amend condition number four of the commission's June 26, 2018 special permit and site plan approvals to build a new athletic facility for property located in two acre zone at 635. Rocktown Road. Mr. Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, it's Steve Finn. Uh, with me here tonight are Aaron Cooper, who is the head of school for the New Canaan Country School, Stephanie Ziegler, who is vice president of the Board of Trustees, and Randy Salvatore, who's president of the Board of Trustees. I'm going to start off with some brief comments, then I'm going to call on Aaron to give you a little bit of an introduction. And then I'm going to resume uh, the presentation, which I don't think is going to be that long. Uh, New Canaan Country School was founded in 1916 and has been an integral part of New Canaan since uh, for over 200 years. I'm sorry, over 100 years. It provides an excellent alternative to our public schools for children from preschool through the ninth grade. In addition, New Canaan Country School provides significant other benefits to the community. For example, by allowing its athletic fields and gymnasium to be used by townwide baseball and basketball leagues, and providing use of its facilities during the summer for the Horizons program. As many of you may know, Horizons is a program for kindergarten through 12 students from low income families, providing academic, artistic, and athletic opportunities. <clears throat> Horizons is now a national program but interestingly enough, it was started in 1964 by George Stephen at the New Canaan Country School, who was the headmaster at that time. <clears throat> uh, for a little bit more detail on the New Canaan Country School, I am going to ask uh, Aaron Cooper, head of school, to address you right now. Aaron? Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, as Steve said, my name's Aaron Cooper. I'm the head of school at New Canaan Country School. This is my Second year here, not not quite two full years in, and and um, I'm really honored to be uh, the head of of um, such a uh, of a school with such a rich history. Um, not only in educating children, but also being part of the fabric of this town, and um, and you know being neighbor being good neighbors is really um, an important component of that to us. Um, as Steve said. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the, um, the school program as it impacts the specifics of, of this project. Um, so we're, as Steve mentioned, a three-year-old through ninth grade school. Um, programmatically, what that really means is it's, it's um, an elementary and middle school, and our athletic program sort of follows al along with that. So um, from an athletic standpoint, um, our, our games are only on weekday afternoons, so ne never in the evenings or in the weekends. Um, and uh, um, our practices end, uh, they're part of our school day and end at four o'clock every day. And that's uh, uh, often the final use of the athletic facilities. Um, on the game days, once or twice a week, um, those will go till the, the hour between five and six o'clock or so. so um, but for some occasional special events, um, we don't use those facilities past that time. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, we do, uh, after that time, 
um, have a partnership with New Canaan Baseball for some of our fields and with New Canaan Basketball for our um, gymnasia. And uh, those are long start, long standing partnerships um, that that are are um, are ones that we provide um, essentially uh, gratis to those organizations um, in in partnership um, with our town. And and that is what um, results in some of the later afternoon and early evening use of of that facility. Um, I will also say, um, as head of school, I live adjacent to the campus as well, and I can understand um, certainly uh, some of the content in the letters that were sent um, from some of our other neighbors. Um, the, the construction lights have been left on inadvertently past, past um, the time um, that we would expect them to, and they're, and they're quite bright. Um, and so we know that that's obtrusive, but we also know that the permanent situation will be um, quite different. The, um, the, the permanent lights are very different from the construction lights and the um, thick translucent um, barriers uh, uh, um, and sheeting has just been installed. And even now, I think only on three of the four elevations um, and those significantly uh, dim the light. And, um, and so that, that's sort of the, the overview for me and I'll, I'll turn it back to Steve. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. So um, what is before you tonight is an application to modify one condition of approval of the previously approved special permit to build a new athletic facility to replace an old and obsolete gymnasium that was over 45 years old. Um, the application to build the new athletic facility was originally approved on June 26, 2018, and the approval contains 16 conditions. As many of you may recall that were on the commission at that time, that application to build a new athletic facility was strongly opposed by a neighbor who owned a home which was located by far the closest of any neighbor to the New Canaan Country School and very close, or relatively close to where the new athletic facility was going to be built. The address of that neighbor's property is 579 Frogtown Road which immediately abuts New Canaan Country School property to the east and south. 579 Frogtown Road is over eight acres, but the residence is not centrally located on that site, but it was, it's located in the northwest section of that property, relatively close to the New Canaan Country School and the location of the new athletic facility. At the time of the original application, 579 Frogtown Road was owned by Ms. Moore. She retained both an attorney and a landscape architect to assist her in opposing the original application. Uh, despite the strong opposition, the commission approved that application on June 26, 2018. As mentioned, the approval contained a number of conditions. A couple of the conditions, or a few of the conditions, were intended to ameliorate uh, Ms. Moore's or the neighbor's concerns about light emanating from the new building. <clears throat> Despite the placement of these conditions, uh, Ms. Moore, through counsel, took an appeal of the approval to the Connecticut Superior Court. A settlement was reached fairly early on in the appeal process, resolving the appeal, and which provided the terms of that settlement provided that New Canaan Country School would purchase 579. Um, uh, Frogtown Road. <clears throat> As required under Connecticut law, that settlement agreement was approved by both this commission and Judge Berger of the Superior Court. And on June 10th, 2019, Buchanan Country School took title to 579 Frogtown Road, also known as the Moore property. One of the original conditions of approval, condition number four, which is the one we seek to modify tonight with our pending application, provided as follows. I'm going to read this into the record. The applicant shall install blackout shades on the windows for the gymnasium portion of the building. Shades shall be mechanically operated with automatic controls that include an electric eye to detect the times of year when the sun has set and shall be activated within 10 minutes of sunset to prevent light from projecting from the gymnasium windows. All non-safety related interior lighting shall be turned off nightly by 9 p.m. Now, in preparing for tonight's hearing, I realized 
that the condition I quoted in the special permit statement that's attached to the application form was based on uh, the original approvals. At some later point, the conditions were modified with the approval of this commission and the language of condition number four was changed to the version I just read to you. And that, that condition, that version of the condition is the one that's attached to uh, as an exhibit to the special permit application. As I said, the one I just read to you is the accurate version, the active condition that we seek to modify. Um, New Canaan Country School respectfully submits that the blackout shades were not really necessary even when New Canaan's Country School was not the owner of 579 Frogtown Road because the building was and is basically required to go dark at 9 p.m. Certainly now that the New Canaan Country School owns that property um, and the condition was intended to protect, protect the uh, 579 Frogtown Road, the blackout shades should no longer be required. Um, <clears throat> now, we know that a few neighbors have recently sent in emails to Lynn uh, about the lights. And as I read all of the uh, emails, they only concern the lights at night. Um, by the way, notice of this application was sent by mail to all the neighbors, which are about 44 in number. Now, with all respect, we think the complaints about the lighting are misplaced for a number of reasons. First of all, the lighting, as Aaron mentioned just a few minutes ago, the lighting described in the emails is construction lighting. It is no way representative of the permanent lighting which will be installed in this building. Construction lighting, as I understand it, is meant to be very, very bright and illuminate all areas of the building in order to assist the workers in getting into the nooks and crannies of the building and making sure they're building the building correctly. Um, in addition, the construction lights do not have any shades or real con or directional control. In contrast, the light, the permanent lights to be installed in the new athletic facility will be significant, significantly less bright, will have solid shades on top, which will direct the light downward. Also, during construction, the upper part of the outside walls of the building were left open until recently. So on those occasions when the construction crew left the construction lights on at night, there was nothing to reduce this very strong illumination coming from uh, the construction lights. When the building is completed, these openings will be covered with X-Tech polycarbonate material which is not transparent, it's translucent. X-Tech is a thermal break translucent wall system that consists of a two inch thick panel. They are not technically windows and are not transparent. And one can argue don't require blackout shades even under condition number four. We did submit as exhibits to a letter I, I, I uh, emailed to Lynn on April 24th pictures of the uh, X-Tech material and if any members of the commission would like those brought up on screen in case you don't have copies handy, uh, please let me know and I'll ask Lynn to call them up on the screen. Um, <clears throat> the X-Tech uh, will significantly reduce the lighting coming from the building. The lighting diagram, which is also submitted with my letter to Lynn dated April 24th, 2020 shows how quickly the light dissipates from the building. In other words, the lighting diagram shows that light from the building ceases illuminating areas outside the building a very short distance from the building. So for example, on the south side of the building, the light basically stops illuminating things outside the building about 50 feet south of the building. 50 feet. And to the east, where the Moore property was, is, and which was currently owned by New Canaan Country School, the light goes down to zero. The light illuminating uh, fact of the light goes down to zero at the property line between the New Canaan Country School and the Moore property. Um, now, I'm not claiming that someone 
standing out on Frogtown Road is not going to be able to see this light. But the point is that since the light, the illumination aspect of this light is dissipating so quickly, the impact or the ability to see this light from, from distances away, while certainly it's going to be seen, is going to be very, very muted and at very low levels. Uh, I think that's the purpose of the lighting diagram I gave to you. Um, so we think the neighbors were looking at construction lights that were not impaired by any uh, materials at all and thinking that's the way it's going to look when the building is finished and as I just described to you that th that is that is not accurate um, and understandably they didn't they may not have known about this um, uh, the neighbors also seem to assume that the landscaping that exists on the site now will be what is in place when the building is completed. It appears that at the time they submitted their emails, they were unaware of the elaborate landscaping plan. Now I see some of the neighbors on, are on and perhaps they'll correct me that, that, that they did know about the elaborate landscaping plan, but um, that landscaping plan is part of the approval and the landscaping will not be placed until the building is almost complete. <clears throat> the landscape plan calls for a robust buffer to be planted south and east of the building. And some of the trees called for in the planting plan are 24 to 26 feet in height. I think it also important to note that the houses of the neighbors who have written emails are located three to four times away from the building then the former Moore House is located. And we submitted an exhibit and then can you call up the, uh, or put up the uh, site distance diagram? Yep. Yes, can everyone still hear me? We can. Yes, thank you. So the diagram that you're looking at now shows the, uh, an outline of the uh, new athletic uh, facility uh, towards the top, a little bit left of center. Thank you, thanks Lynn. As you can see, and this was done by, by um, uh, McCord Engineering for us. As you can see, the Moore House it was, is 234 feet from the nearest corner. Um, uh, but the neighbors at, uh, to, the, to the south, one is located, their nearest location is 930 feet away from the closest point of the athletic center. And the other neighbor is 820 feet away. So that's, that's quite a long distance. And as I said, we're not saying they may not be able to see some light emanating from this building up until 9 p.m., but we're not talking about uh, immediately adjacent neighbors uh, who don't have a significant buffer, not only by way of distance, but also by way of screening. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Lynn. Again, I think this is crucial. The lights will be turned off at 9 p.m. except on rare occasion where with prior approval of the town planner for special events, the New Canaan Country School can use it for its own events, not, not New Canaan basketball. By comparison, the Winter Club, which is also on Frogtown Road, throws off much more light and which is on at least until 10 p.m. Uh, the, the light from the new winter club dwarfs, I think, any other light in the neighborhood. Um, now, as Aaron mentioned, the country school wants to be the best neighbor possible. But this includes not only the handful of neighbors who have sent emails in about this application, it also importantly includes the entire New Canaan community as a whole. As Aaron indicated, the new, the new athletic facility is only used for New Canaan country school activities until around 
uh, 6 p.m. at night. Of course, there is some cleaning that has to take place afterwards, which requires the lights to be on. But essentially, uh, the country school's use of this facility is going to end by 6.30 or 7. <clears throat> um, thereafter, it is used by an outside community organization. So here are a couple of last thoughts for, for the members of the commission. And as always, I thank you for your attention. The cost of the blackout shades is over $200,000. And given the times we are currently in, that is a relatively expensive installation. <clears throat> I know the commission uh, does not typically look at financial consequences when it comes to the ability, but when it comes to the ability of a private school to provide a benefit to the New Canaan community as a whole, I think the commission should take into consideration a cost benefit analysis. What benefit is going to be obtained or achieved by requiring these blackout shades um, given what we consider to be the very low light levels that'll be present up until 9 p.m. in order to accommodate a New Canaan community organization. And we think uh, that, that when you take that, it, that, that, that gets us well past the goal line in, in supporting our request for uh, a modification to this condition. Um, so for those reasons, um, we don't think the, uh, we think our request is more than reasonable. Again, putting aside the cost benefit analysis, what we have here in support of our application is the 9 p.m. shutdown, the nature of the permanent lights that will be installed, the installation of the translucent, not transparent X-Tech wall system, the substantial landscaping plan, and the distance the neighbors are from this building. So um, that uh, concludes my remarks. Uh, um, there are members of our team here and certainly I'm available to answer any questions. I do wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you Mr. Finn. Commissioner's uh, questions for the applicant. John, I, I just interrupt for a moment. This is Jack on the line here since as, you know, Steve began his presentation. Uh, my what my visual doesn't work, and if you can include me, do. And if not, I'll just uh, stay on and uh, and listen. Uh, Mr. Finn, are you comfortable, Mr. Um, Flynn? I mean, Mr. Finn. Mr. Flynn was not able to see the map you showed, but it was in the prior materials. So I did. I can see everything. Oh, you can. Okay, great. Then you're good to go, Jack. Right. You just can't see me. Yeah, you're seated. Thank you. I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. I, you, I'm not sure you're still asking me, uh, Mr. Goodwin, but I'm fine with Mr. Flynn participating uh, um, okay, on this matter. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Yeah, I have a question. Steve, those two neighbors that you pointed out on your, uh, on your diagram, uh, what are the names of those two neighbors? Uh, um, it was uh, Jack Flynn. Yeah, Jack Flynn. Um, they are... Um, just here with me. One is Mr. Liebau. Okay, thank you. And one is Mr. <coughs> Bazella. And I hope I'm pronouncing their names correctly. I do want to point out to the commission that we we did receive three other emails. One was from a Miss Sneerson who lives significantly to the north of the school on Wing Road. And then uh, earlier today. Lynn forwarded an email to me from, um, bear with me here. Lynn, do you have that name handy? I'm going to get it for you right now. The, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Finn, the email was forwarded to the commissioners. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I seem to have misplaced that last email. Um, we also received an email from, uh, and I'm not going to pronounce his name correctly, Mr. Castorangan of 359 Frogtown Road. He actually sent an email to me directly. Uh, the other emails went to Lynn and then were forwarded to me. And I did have an exchange with Mr. Castorangan. I responded to his, his, uh, uh, his questions in an email. You may have a copy of that. 
And he wrote me back on April 22nd saying, thanks, Mr. Finn, for your prompt reply, that it's just a modification that does not impact me slash us. I am living at my house and am glad the facility is beyond our sight, is what he said. And then yeah, you know, Finn, we, have that, we have that one as well. All right. My only other comment is that um, the the uh, the comments by um, Ms. Snearson, Ms. Snearson's letter was very, very brief. And the letter that was, or the email that was received today, they all focused in on light. I, that's the only thing I took from those letters were concerns about light, nothing else. The letter today came from Simon Bradley and it was sent to me at 919 this morning and then it was forwarded on to the commission. And it was posted on our website this morning as well. Great. Commissioners, uh, additional questions for Mr. Finn or the, anybody in the applicant? Um, I do. This is Dan Redman. Go ahead, Can Dan. I talk? Yes. Okay. Um, so, a uh, couple questions. First, uh, <laughs> Mr. Flynn, uh, I, uh, Mr. Finn, sorry, I think you're absolutely correct. The commission really isn't concerned about the cost implications of this component, uh, specifically because this is something that would have been budgeted into your project cost two years ago before any of the current situations would have been impacting your project. Um, secondly, the, uh, the lights that are in the gymnasium, this is going to be a gymnasium, so I would imagine those are fairly bright in order to, knowing the type of lighting that's put into anything from the YMCA gymnasium to the school gymnasium, the high school gymnasium, it's going to be fairly bright lighting. Um, I agree that the polycarbonate is going to diffuse a little bit, um, but at what there, the height of the polycarbonate that's at the ribbon at the clear story of the entire building, do you know what height the lights are relative to the bottom of that poly, polycarbonate? Meaning do the heights, the lights hang below the sill of the polycarbonate windows or are they above it? Uh, I think Mr. Rabin and I, Stephanie Ziegler can correct me if I'm wrong. I think they're going to hang about halfway down the polycarbonate wall. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Stephanie, is that correct? And, oh, yes. Okay. So there, there will still be some light bleed from those through the polycarbonate and I do have to correct you, uh, and I, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I'm probably speaking for a few others on the commission. E consideration only for the adjacent neighbor was not really the way this original application was approved. It was in consideration of all the neighbors and the implication that the building would have on all the surrounding neighbors. It's a very tall building. It's four stories tall. It's it's very large. It's yeah, and we and I remember talking about this specifically. The clear story being the beacon of light. I think that's in the minutes somewhere. So we were very concerned about the the lighting from that. That being said, you're right. You're you're being limited to nine o'clock as the time off for the lighting. Um, I'm just wondering is if there's a way you could what I'll call future proof for the provision of shades. If this becomes a problem in the future, when everything is completed and your, your normal cycle of activities is in place and the lights turn off at nine o'clock and no one's affected by it, then all the better. But if it is, you would at least be future proofed with wiring where you could put the shades in later because there is a substantial amount of wiring involved. Um, should I respond, uh, Mr. Goodwin? Uh, please do. Yeah. Um, so look, I, I, I don't get involved, Mr. Ravin, with the budgeting. I, I, I do know that sometimes, and you know much more about this than I do, I, I know that cost of construction sometimes meet their budget and sometimes they don't. And I don't know what the story is with regard to this project. I know that $200,000 expense is, has been expressed to my client, by my client to me as being very, very significant in terms of where things are at at this time. Uh, no, I, under, I understand that. I, I completely understand. I'm just saying that that even during the original application and approval, that the cost of uh, a component of one of the conditions is not necessarily a consideration of the commission. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, but but at the time we applied, obviously blackout shades were not were not were not on anybody's radar. So if they if they costed this out at the time of the application, we we never planned to put the blackout shades in. I, I know that I'm fairly confident of that. That when they designed this building and we and we were uh, we submitted an application, uh, that budget at that time I I would be shocked. And again, I I, I asked. Uh, either Stephanie or, or, or Randy to comment on that. That would not, I don't think, been a budgeted item. That Mr. Is fair, Stephanie? Mr. Finn, I'm sorry, I have to uh, jump in here. It's Ken Turner. Yeah. Um, your line item, as far as uh, your construction estimate, has contingencies for items like this that might come up, unforeseen conditions. This is typical of every construction project. I, I'm not. I don't agree with you for one moment that shades were not anticipated. True, yes. However, unforeseen conditions are part of any construction estimate. And <clears throat> would you please clarify? I think I heard you say two hundred thousand, and then you said four hundred thousand. What is your understanding of the cost of these shades, Mr. Turner? If I said four hundred thousand dollars, I misspoke. It's two hundred. I've been told it's two hundred thousand. And who and who may who developed the cost estimate for that? I, I received that directly from my client. I don't know the the contractor or the lighting firm that came up with that estimate. This is um, this is Randy <laughs> Salvatore. Um, if I can, um, and said, sorry, something's wrong with my video. So hopefully, can you hear me, uh, Mr. Salvatore? Yeah, we can you. hear you. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you all for your time on this. Um, if I can kind of give maybe a little bit more of a background on, on this. Clearly when we submitted, as Steve just said, we never intended to do blackout shades. As we went through the process and the process, and I agree, it's, it's always about the community and about the neighborhood, but primarily what this was, a lot of the conditions were about the Moors because we were all trying to work together to try to resolve and try to come to a compromise. And as you know, we met with the Moors on a number of occasions and continued to negotiate. We added excessive, extensive, let me say, and perhaps excessive landscaping throughout 26 foot trees, which that's not typical for, um, for any type of them. And we did it all in the intention that we could have um, satisfied them. In the end, we didn't, but we were, obviously we were granted the approval with all of those conditions in there. Subsequent to that, we went back after the appeal and tried to find a way to, to make it happen. And we, we had a negotiation, as you all know, with the Moors and it all resolved in a, in a positive way. But at the time we had every expectation and maybe, maybe unfounded, but that some of those conditions that we didn't think were really typical of an application like this to have blackout shades on, on structures in this type of a thing. These are not windows, these are fans with things in a facility that we only use until really we, we close, the lights will be closed before six o'clock on every night. Our facilities are even used, we, our students finish at about 4.30. Um, so the condition that we had about the nine o'clock was all because, as Steve said, because of charitable works that we do for the community to have them there. And now we're really faced with, with a situation. Um, and, and while economics shouldn't shouldn't matter. Um, unfortunately, they do. And this world is turned upside down right now for, um, for everyone here. So $200,000 is meaningful for us now. If it's something that we personally don't believe is a condition that would have been granted if we had owned that house initially. Um, and maybe as an alternative. Um, so um, Mr. Radman, your suggestion, um, I think we'd be more than happy to, um, to go ahead and do the wiring and then see how it comes out. If it's a problem, we would want to do it. We don't believe it's going to be a problem. The other alternative is perhaps if you can give us the option, it's something that we as a board could, could look at is that um, we do that as one thing. And then if not, maybe we decide if we were going to close this building at six o'clock, then clearly we wouldn't be having this discussion. I wouldn't think about blackout shades because nine or 10 months of the year, you never even see light at that point, but then Perhaps we modify the condition to go back to a six o'clock time frame and don't do the blackout shades if that can be at our option. Obviously, um, because at some point we still have to serve our constituents and 
it's a tough sell for us to tell parents that their tuitions are going to be dictated or their, their campaign contributions are going to be done um, to benefit other other people. So maybe there's some option and then we as a board can, can deliberate. I just throw that out as a possibility if that's something that you'd be inclined to, to do um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this. Thank you, Randy. I, I have one other quick comment and that is, you know, as the, as the original approval, condition number four uh, provided the applicant shall install blackout shades for all windows visible from 579 Frogtown, from the 579 Frogtown property, including any windows from which light can be projected or reflected. Now, that was changed in connection with the settlement to the language I just read you, but it does show that when this commission issued its original approval, the concerns were about the Moore property. Now, my recollection is, is I believe Mr. Liebau uh, uh, did write letters back then as well, expressing concerns about traffic and light. But, um, you know, it's not as if he was around for the original modifications and not taking appeal. And at that time, we didn't know what the material, the exact material, I didn't think, I didn't know at the time that we were gonna be installing uh, translucent material along the, uh, the upper part of the building as opposed to transparent windows. And maybe, to me, that's a significant difference and really starts to obviate the need for these blackout shades, uh, especially given how far away these neighbors really are. Okay, additional uh, questions for the applicant, Mr. Chris? Yes, uh, John Chris speaking. Um, I'm looking at the various pictures that Mr. Liebau uh, submitted to the commission with appear to be photographs from his house, inside his house, out towards the gymnasium, which is under construction. And I'm looking at the lights, and they are very visible. Um, and I'm generally sensitive to institutional uses in residential areas. I think people want to have quiet enjoyment of their property, and light infiltration can affect quiet enjoyment. With the lights I'm looking at here, even if they were to be cut in half, it'd still be quite noticeable to my sense. And so I'm, um, I'm cautious about the light infiltration, even with the conditions that um, the applicant is uh, suggesting regarding the translucent materials and so forth. So um, it still seems quite bright to me. Okay. Can I uh, respond, Mr. Goodwin? Sure. Yeah, my understanding uh, from talking to uh, my client who spoke to the construction manager that we're not sure, and perhaps Mr. Liebau can comment on this, but those photographs were taken of the construction lights where the openings were, were open. There was no material place. It's not like that light was going through the translucent material. So it's, it's, it's not a fair comparison to look at those photographs and then try to extrapolate, well, even if it's the permanent lighting is less bright, it still may have an impact. You'd have to see the permanent lighting through the translucent material, which I don't believe was in place when the photographs were taken. It looks to me like it was just a, an opening. Granted, it's hard to tell based on the photographs, but it looks to me like there was nothing. It was just open, open to the air, which I think is a significant point. Um, Thank you. Mr. Goodwin, Mr. Turner has his hand raised. Mr. Turner. Yes, um, <clears throat> if I could just maybe talk a little bit about light and um, what it does as a source. Um, regardless if, it, if it's clear glass or if it's a polycarbon material, light is measured in lumens, it will emanate from the surface, from the source, those light fixtures. Um, granted, it will be diffused, but you're still going to see a tremendous amount of lighting coming from those polycarbon panels. Think of it as a uh, flashlight. Uh, the top six, eight feet of that building are going to be illuminated around the entire perimeter. It will be seen by not only the five neighbors, regardless of the distance, 
um, that have come forward and complained about the, the lighting. Um, you cannot diffuse it. It is visible in the night time and <clears throat> in the winter time after six o'clock, um, the sun is down. Um, so, you know, you can't use the argument um, that the light is not going to be perceived because it's a polycarbon panel. It is translucent. It emits light. Um, there's no scientific uh, foundation here as far as how many foot candles the translucent panel will project versus a clear light um, or no, no windows. Um, uh, during the construction, but um, you know, I'm sure that we're more than welcome to uh, entertain some foot candle studies that are founded on science, that are founded on engineering, uh, and that it can be measured from uh, the properties that the five properties that have complained. And it really doesn't matter if it's 10 feet or 600 feet at night. In a dark sky, you will see it. Yeah, I think this is Dan Radman. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Ken. That's, you know, it's, there's a difference between measurable light and perceived light. And in, in this particular condition, we're, we're talking about the perceived light of the clear story of the building and how visible it is from basically 360 degrees. So any, any neighbor that's going to have any eye shot of that building. Um, I, I'm just very cautious of this, of you know, the years of going through the back and forth with Grace Farms and all of the issues we have there with the light bleed from the building itself and the, the blackout curtains and the motorized apparatus that were used there to satisfy neighbors' concerns ongoing and ongoing for years to get that resolved. I, I don't want to repeat that here. Agree. Um, may I ask uh, Attorney Flynn a question, or uh, maybe Randy, uh, what what was the overall construction budget? It was about $10 million. $10 million. So 200000 of the $10 million is uh, less than 1% of your construction cost. Um, did you consider other things in your construction program that you might reduce as far as quality to save money, to pay for something as important as the shades are. So we've considered every single thing to come up with this budget. We, our initial budgets were about $20 million for this project. So we've taken every liberty understanding that this is all about the students and about creating an atmosphere for them and not building something that's overbuilt. So that I can tell you, um, I guess the distinction here is we disagree about whether this is something that is needed, I think. Um, and you know, the other thing I think is important to look at is we're, th those photos, first of all, I don't believe were taken with, the, with anything on the building. Um, and but that being said, let's compare this to the winter club or something that's a very noxious type of a, type of a thing that people are, are used to there. This is something that's in the background and we are, our, our building is only open, like we said, with a condition until nine o'clock. I think we could agree to probably an earlier condition um, or at least have the option to not do the shades then because that's something that we would consider. And I'll, um, re I'll repeat that. So $200,000 is $200,000. Um, and um, so, so we don't look at it saying what percentage it is. We look at it always what's the value and where the landscaping, for instance, we're spending about $200,000 on the, the increased landscaping that we did, we're not coming back to the commission for that to try to get any modification on that because that we see benefit to the community, to the neighborhood, to everyone around. So, um, so this is really the only modification we've come back with after, after settling with the Moors, considering so many other things that we had agreed to in terms of reduced building height, um, in terms of positioning of the building, all those different things. We, we never came back to the commission for those. This is one thing that we, we don't see it, but um, uh, so that's why we're here, quite honestly. And, and if I just may add a couple more things. I, I, I've been by the building twice in the last week and I've been surprised about how low it actually sits from the Southern exposure. And, it, and there's already a, a deep, there already is some buffer there 
Now, granted, there have been some trees removed in order to construct, but I think we're also missing out on the fact that the landscape buffer here is going to be robust and is going to mitigate this, uh, this light to some extent. Now, granted, the, the height of the building may be higher than some of the trees, but again, it's being shut off at 9 p.m. The building sits relatively low, and um, I still maintain that the purpose of this original condition, as it was originally formulated, was to protect 579 Frogtown Road, which was only 234 feet away and that we're really going way overboard. And, and to the extent that someone thought that I was trying to argue that the light won't be seen from these other houses, no, I understand. Just like you can see the light at the top of St. Mark's from just about any high point in New Canaan, you may see some of this light up until 9 p.m. And, and I'm not trying to argue that you won't. I'm just saying that it's gonna be relatively muted and for a relatively short period of time uh, into the night. Okay, After nine o'clock, it. it's going to be done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, let's uh, let's hear from the public. Would anyone from the public like to address this application, please? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to um, unmute them one by one. So you got um, Jack Liebau first. Okay, Mr. Liebau. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay. I, Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> I think as the retired uh, Mr. Uh, excuse me, M Mrs. Niebau, Mr. Niebau, kindly state your names and your addresses, please. Jack and Carol Liebau, 568 Frogtown Road. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yes, and we're grateful to uh, be given the opportunity to be heard before the committee. And at the outset, uh, we'd like to uh, express how much, uh, how sorry we are to have to appear because our children ha had attended New Canaan Country School since 2011. And we applaud the leadership of Randy Salvatore as, as chairman of the Board of Trustees of Country, of country School, Aaron Cooper's leadership as its uh, head of school and everything Stephanie Ziegler has done to get this building built. And we want the school to be able to use it uh, for the children of New Canaan Country School, for Horizon School, I mean, for Horizon and for the community for many years to come. We want them to be able to use it for uh, athletic events in the evening, for dances, for whatever use the school and the community might find helpful, useful, and reasonable. And um, that's why we're concerned that if th these shades are not put on, uh, we are all going to come to a situation where it turns out to be a problem. Um, I'd like to call the commissioner's attention to number four in the conditions and, uh, and the fact that in the minutes of June 26, where it says the applicant shall install blackout shades for all windows visible from 579 Frogtown Road property and including any window from which light can be projected or reflected. Um, it seems to me that if Mr. Flynn were correct and that that were intended to govern only the, the, for, the former property that belonged to Mrs. Moore, they, it could have just ended with from 579 Frogtown Road property. There would have been no need for the clause talking about and including any window from which light can be projected or reflected. Now, we all understand, I run a small nonprofit and we understand um, the exigencies that are being visited upon everyone um, because of costs. And we don't want New Canaan Country School to have to incur unneeded costs. Um, but, Hopefully this is, is why the school has been able to or will be able to obtain stimulus money. And the fact is that this light is clearly visible as our pictures show. If any commissioner is in doubt, um, any of them are most cordially welcome at our, our home to come and see this light. And our concern is that if the shades or some prevent vision for these shades are not installed and the building is completed and this does turn out to be a problem or in the future the school does need to use or the community needs to use this building. Um, it is an annoyance. It does disturb our quiet use and enjoyment of our property and there will be no meaningful redress because as Mr. Flynn conceded, the, 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 
there is no real shading that is going to be sufficient just based on um, shrubbery and, 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 and trees. Um, the Bradleys, as, as they pointed out, their house, um, which was not included in, in council's diagram, also uh, can see it from their house, which is, I think, closer uh, to Mrs. Well, to the, the gym than, uh, than our house is. And they also see this light very clearly. And so for all these reasons, um, with regret, because we love New Canaan Country School, we don't want it to have to incur any unneeded expense, but we are concerned that if th this arrangement is not needed now, we will continue to have to come back and we don't want to have to do this. Um, we want the school to be able to use the gym. We want to be able to be good neighbors and to let the school go forward uh, without having to appear before you again and again and again. And that's why we just ask you to let the special permit go forward in the original form in which it was approved. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, uh, who else from the public, please? You have uh, Mr. Bozella. Okay, Mr. Bozella is... Hi, members of the commission. Uh, Joe Bozella here, 584 Frogtown Road, directly uh, across from basically the, the, the boundary between the Moore property uh, and the uh, country school. So just, just two points. I mean, I don't want to go through and rebut Mr. Finn's um, presentation point by point, although I'm happy to do that by letter if the commission's interested, but, but two points I think are critical here. One is we keep using the winter club, which is a big source of light pollution in this area. I hear from Mr. Salvatore and Mr. Finn using that as a reason to add additional light pollution to the area. And I just can't think of another type pollution where you would point to a greater pollutant and say, because we're less of a pollutant than that, then it's okay. So that's, the, that's the, my first issue. And the second is that the additional landscaping that isn't mentioned here is crucial to this whole thing. However, there is no way that even after years of the maturation of that landscaping, that it will reach high enough to block out the light from this top floor. So really the only way to prevent the light emanating from that top floor are these blackout screens. And those are really the, the, the two biggest points I wanted to make. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Len, thank anyone you. else from the public? Um, possibly two. Um, Jennifer Holm, do you wanna say something? Okay, let's keep moving. Mr. Moynihan, do you want to say anything? He's, he's not at his uh, screen. No, he's not. Okay. Oh, wait. Hold on, I'm just watching. Do, okay. Okay, anyone else from the public? Um, there is not. It's um, just Channel 79, um, Grace Duffield from the McKinnon Advertiser, and Stephanie Radman, I'm guessing, is Dan's wife. Yes. And Glenn. So, yes, there's nobody else. Okay. Um, uh, I heard a couple of things, a um, couple of ideas, um, <clears throat> perhaps for the commissioners and then the applicant. Um, and I'm not convinced these are good ideas. You know, what I try to do is throw out potential solutions. Um, one is we continue this and um, we have the applicant uh, potentially uh, pay for a lighting expert to assess the need. Um, commissioners, is that a viable option? Okay, well, that's um, having having gone through this on other commercial projects, uh, the lighting expert, I mean, they'll give you an opinion, uh, but they're not going to come up with any quantitative measure of lighting at those distances from that light source. You, as you can see from the lighting map that was submitted by the applicant, you get to zero foot candles within 30 to 50 feet of the perimeter of the building. 
Um, and, and that's just the nature of the light meter. Again, it's not measurable light, it's perceived light. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we're worried about. Um, so you don't, you don't think that can get us to a solution then, Dan? No, I don't. Okay. Um, second question, uh, John, Mr. Chris. John, put on your mic. Excuse me, um, John Chris speaking. Uh, question for Attorney Finn. To what extent can the school install these translucent panels sooner than later and then turn some lights on as they would be on if the gym were operational so that we can see live and in person exactly what the uh, light infiltration will be in neighboring properties without shades? and then make a decision then if you defer the application, something along those lines. Well, I, I think I need to defer to Stephanie and Randy a bit on this because I'm not sure when the lights are gonna be installed, the permanent lights are gonna be installed, Mr. Cruz. So, and that, that obviously is an important element of your, of your suggestion. So I don't know when that's likely to happen. So maybe Randy or Stephanie can answer that question. So Stephanie Ziegler speaking. Um, right now, the XTEC panels have been installed on that south side that was the picture from the Liebaus. Um, So you are able to see that. Again, the lighting is very different given the construction lighting that casts in every direction versus the downward lighting that will come in the future. Those lights will likely not be installed until maybe early June, late May. I don't have an exact date yet, um, but it will be within the next couple months. Okay, and then uh, my next question for the applicant is, Mr. Salvatore, you mentioned uh, turning the lights off at 6 p.m. Is this a condition that um, you, you would potentially accept? So what, what I was suggesting is if, if this condition is inclined to deny the request, then perhaps there's an alternate that we could accept in that if we agree to that condition. For that, we'd have to go back to our board to verify that that's something, um, because right now we have, haven't in the past used it past that time period. So we just wanna look into the future and make sure, because these decisions go long beyond my time here. Um, but quite honestly, it would not hurt us at all as a school community um, to do that. But, um, but we would under want to understand the consequence it would have to the community and so on. So what I'm suggesting is perhaps that's an alternate way of dealing, give us the option that if we were gonna turn them off, if we agreed to that condition, and then we don't have to, to go ahead with the blackout shades, and then we could go back and, and decide and then come back to, um, to you with that. Okay, and then um, back to Mr. Radman with a question, which um, I'll then flip to the applicant. Um, Mr. Radman, you mentioned future proofing, which I assume means putting in the mechanisms to install the shades and then be able to make a determination or did I or explain to me what you mean by future proofing? Yeah, that's basically what I meant. I mean, there's, there's obviously the real estate for the shades that has to be allocated and detailed into the construction of the window heads uh, where the shades would live. Um, but there's also a substantial amount of uh, uh, electrical wiring and control wiring that would have to be installed along the perimeter in order to make that kind of a system work. And as you can imagine, trying to open up ceilings and fish wiring through at a later date is quite, uh, uh, quite difficult, um, more difficult than just installing the shade. Um, so my suggestion was uh, to future proof it for the possibility of shades and to see what the final uh, product of the lighting solution, the polycarbonate install, and the time, agreed time of, you know, lights off would be and how that would impact the neighborhood. Okay. And if it proves to be a problem in the future, we, you know, we'd, we'd have to somehow enforce putting the shades in, the, the physical shades at a later date. But that, that would present its own problems that, you know, I'm sure the the argument back from the applicant will be, well, we can't do it now because it's a fundraising issue and, you know, it'll take us a year or two to put that together. And, you know, there's all types of downsides to deferring that kind of work. Okay, uh, Mr. Turner. Um, you know, Dan, I appreciate what you're saying as far as the future proofing and, uh, you know, planning ahead. 
Um, unfortunately, the, the cost to future proof the space for the shades um, could be 60, 70 percent of the overall cost. Um, That's true. I'm not sure the applicant, um, you know, uh, if they're aware of that potential cost, would be willing to um, <clears throat> fork that out or, you know, pay for that up front. Uh, <clears throat> run, you know, taking the chance that uh, they might not be required. So I'm not sure. I mean, it's just, to me, it just interests the argument of how we deal with it in the future. Right. Okay. I'll flip it back to the applicant and uh, from the applicant with Mrs. Ziegler. Thank you. Um, we would be able to um, accommodate that condition of putting in and future pushing with all the wiring. Um, from my understanding, it is the customization of the shape of the shades um, that is causing the actual um, excessive cost. So I do believe that we are able to accommodate the wiring and to future-proof the building. Okay. Anybody else from the applicant? Uh, any, any, any other members of the team? Yes, sir. Yes, um, uh, this is Aaron Cooper again. I just wanted to reflect back on the question of the earlier timing um, that you were discussing with Mr. Salvatore. And I think the, the important component is that um, and certainly it would have to you know, be a discussion of the Board of Trustees, but at this point from a programmatic standpoint, there is no use um, beyond that six o'clock time by the school. It's actually um, by the New Canaan basketball in the town um, that is that later time. And it's part of the relationship we have with the town, which is you know, sort of a, um, an added you know, concern around, around, um, around those hours. Okay. Uh, Mr. Goodwin? Yes, sir. So uh, I, I, I'm certainly heard from an, uh, some of the commissioners and, and uh, if we were uh, meeting live at town hall, I'd, I'd probably ask for a brief recess so I could speak to my clients to see how they're reacting to these various options, which I can't do. Uh, so, uh, but I am gonna ask them through this Zoom meeting whether they would prefer that we keep the hearing open so that we can get together and discuss uh, reactions to some of the things that have been suggested and get back to you, uh, uh, you know, in advance of the next meeting. I don't know if yeah, Mr. Stephanie, Randy, was, and Aaron, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to say that was going to be my question for you. Should we continue? So um, Randy and Stephanie and Aaron, uh, you know, We've heard from a couple of the commissioners their views. Uh, none of them strike me as, as great, uh, but they're certainly, if you want, if you think it's worthwhile trying to discuss it uh, and then get back to the commission, we can certainly do that by keeping the public hearing open. Um, alternatively, perhaps, uh, I know the commission has a little bit more business to do tonight. Perhaps the four of us can get on a phone call and. Uh, check back in later on. I wouldn't take too long, Mr. Goodwin, because I know you have a short agenda. Uh, but I don't, I don't have the opportunity to talk to my clients other than through the Zoom meeting right now. So Yeah, Mr. Finney, these are exceptional circumstances. Um, we probably have about another half an hour of a meeting to go, unless we get into a bigger discussion, not sure. Um, given the exceptional circumstances, I can suspend the hearing to, and resume it later in the evening or we can continue it, whichever you'd like to do. So, uh, so uh, you know, Steffi, Aaron, and Randy, would you prefer to talk offline and then report back or would you uh, prefer to keep the hearing open and, uh, and uh, uh, get back to the commission and with uh, responses uh, uh, next meeting. Steve, I defer to you. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we could benefit from uh, not rushing uh, to come back with a response right now. Uh, I think uh, we're better off uh, keeping the hearing open tonight and reporting back uh, uh, before the next meeting. Okay. Uh, Mr. Finn, as you well know, you can also avail yourself of having additional discussions with the planner. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank that. you all. This hearing is continued. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, number two, we have nothing to deliberate on. Uh, number three will be 
quick to close, and we are now in regular meeting mode, taking no public input um, for the rest of the evening. Uh, item number three, proposed telecommunication facility at 183 Soundview Lane. All I wanted to do on this is to report back to you. As you probably remember, this past Tuesday was due to be the, uh, the, the CSC, the Connecticut Site Council, um, physical visit at 183 Soundview as well as a public hearing. Obviously, that was canceled. Um, I guess it was last Tuesday. Um, anyway, um, there was a meeting of the Connecticut Siting Council last Thursday. 183 Soundview was on the agenda. I'm going to ask Lynn to correct me if I get any of this wrong, but basically it was pretty perfunctory in which they were um, seeing if they were going to take any, any interveners or party to the application. Um, uh, the first selectman, uh, as well as myself and Lynn, separately had discussions with the town attorney. Um, the town attorney, I believe, uh, certainly advised me, also advised the first selectman that um, we did not need to become a party or an intervener, that we will um, have our opportunity at a future public hearing to address um, the CSC as to our views on the application. Um, Lynn, anything I missed on that? Nope, you are correct. And um, all the, then there were, um, I believe it was four neighbors, three neighbors and um, St. Luke's school that uh, requested intervener or party status and all were granted at the Connecticut Siding Council's regular meeting on the 23rd of April. Okay, so um, stay tuned. And again, to be crystal clear, um, I've advised the town attorney that um, for, you know, as we talk tonight, um, I plan on addressing at the appropriate time the Connecticut <coughs> Siting Council on behalf of the commission. So stay tuned. Um, next thing we have is what I want to do is I want to flip items four and five. And the reason is some of my comments having to do with item five could have an impact on our discussion of item number four. So item number five, discussion of economic recovery efforts. And you'll remember from uh, last month, um, what I discussed with all of you is Lynn and I had started talking about, um, you know, what is, as we, as we start to emerge from this, clearly there has been stress put on the businesses in town. There's been stress put on the residents. There's been stress put on the institutional uses, so to speak. And uh, it's, it's my view, and, and Lynn concurs, um, that we have to be thinking about what we can do. There's not much we can do right now, but we believe there's a lot we can do as we start to emerge in, in recovery, so to speak. Um, so Lynn and I have been talking about this, and really what I want to do is, is report back to you, give you some thoughts right now, and, and then I wanna get your thoughts, your reactions, your guidance, your input, um, we, um, and I want to suggest the outlines of a plan, of a game plan. Um, we had a fairly lengthy discussion with Ira Bloom and Pete Gelderman talking about legally what we can do. I also wanted to pick their brain about what they're hearing elsewhere. Um, so some of the thoughts are the following. Um, you know, what's the objective of what I'm talking about? The objective is, you know, how do we do our part in helping the town businesses and the institutions get back on their feet, you know, sort of bottom line. Um, operationally, and it's a dirty word, but financially. I, I think given the circumstances we are in, we've tended as a commission to say we're not involved in finances. It's my view that unfortunately, given this world we're in right now, that we have to take financial considerations um, into note. Um, I do note that you know, part of what I'm going to be saying is there going, are going to be trade-offs in terms of traditionally some of the protections that we as a commission have ordered to various constituencies within the town. So I think we will have some trade-offs. And as we continue to talk about this, when you think about this, you know, we're going to have further challenges. The challenges will include, you know, what will be the ongoing social distancing measures that will be put into place or, or how will they evolve? And you clearly know, even as things get opened up, 
we can assume there will be continued social distancing, which will impact the ability of people to do business. You know, it'll be things like seating, store traffic, transportation, um, and just in general rules of engagement. Um, I think there's also going to be another negative impact is going to be the uncertainty of what you can do and when you can do it. So once again, you know, you're a merchant, you're an institution, whatever it is. And not only are you going to have rules put on you, you already have rules put on you, but you'll have rule, continued rules, but there will be this uncertainty as to, you know, when do rules get lifted? When do different things get allowed? Um, so some of the actions that I think we should be considering as a commission, um, it's commission and it's also our discussion, you know, it's also the planning staff, quite frankly, and then it's the planning staff as they're working with the commission and as, as they're working with the rest of town hall, including the first selectman. But, you know, one of the things I've talked to Lynn about is, you know, do we relax the rigor of enforcement in certain situations? Um, you know, for example, the, the, the best example is what we've already done vis-a-vis -vis signs. You know, we're not enforcing sign regulations. It makes no sense. People have to have signs out there communicating things. You know, are you open for takeout? What are you closed for, et cetera, et cetera. A second item we've talked about is increasing administrative approvals as opposed to things necessarily going to the commission. So what happens very often, and, and I'm beating you all know this, but there are, you know, very often there are gray areas, for example, particularly with site plans, where, you know, technically site plans can sometimes be approved administratively. Sometimes they're taken to the commission. Very often what happens is there's a discussion. There's a discussion between Lynn and I, or there's a discussion between Lynn and myself and Ira Bloom in which we say, okay, should this be approved administratively or should this be taken to the commission? So a second area is, and, and part of the objective here is to be able to speed up our response. Okay, that's, you know, that's one of the key things that I'm thinking about is what's the speed for people to be able to get done. So a second item is potentially allowing Lynn and her planning team to do more administrative approvals than would typically, than might necessarily happen. You know, and as I mentioned, I, I mentioned site plans. And as you all know, with site plans is technically a site plan is, is, you know, we give input, we give conditions, but technically a site plan is sort of a tick the box exercise. Um, the other critical area, and I talked about this last month, is relief to special permits. And when you think about this, it's, it's actually twofold the way I'm thinking about this. One is relief to special permit, in place special permits. And then the second aspect, and I don't have a good example of the second one, but the, the second aspect can be potentially allowing um, people to use special permits as a new special permit as a way to get something done, something accomplished. Now, the key question in my mind, at least, that I pose to Bloom and Gelderman, and probably you, or many of you, all of you already know the answer, but my key question to them was, can we amend a special permit or can we grant a special permit which has a time limitation on it? So somebody comes to us, they say, look, you know, I need to do X, Y, Z, we don't want it in per perpetuity, but we want to allow them to do that for a certain amount of time. And the answer is yes. So we can do that. Um, the next thought I have related to that is one of the ideas that I have is if we start to get a flow of, let's say it's site plans or probably more relevantly special permits, we may have to be ready to be quicker, i.e. shorten the approval process. So one of the ideas that we've talked about, we've kicked around and to the extent that, you know, quite frankly, we continue to be on Zoom, it could be easier, is we may have to have more frequent meetings. So if somebody comes in, they need to get something done quickly, um, we may have to have more special meetings. Um, so that's a thought there. Again, the objective here is to give as much tools as possible for people to speed recovery as quickly as possible. Because as I'm sure you know, every day is money when you're trying to recover from something like this. Um, 
The other thing we are doing, we've started to do is I know Lynn is talking among town hall. We've also reached out to Tucker Murphy, both with their hat on the Chamber of Commerce, as well as their hat on the TDAC side. So, you know, another thing we're doing, I'm talking to Lynn about is we need to be reaching out and getting ideas from, you know, the various areas of town government and quasi town government. Um, Another thing, and then more specifically to Lynn that I'm asking Lynn to think about is one of the things I thought about and going back to this idea of potential special permit and amendments and the like is clearly, I assume there's going to be a necessity for us to get um, the input from the relevant area of town hall to say, you, you know, from a perspective of, of opening up and, you know, and, and what's that process you know, there's now going to be a need to send the input from the appropriate organs within town government to say, uh, yeah, we're okay with you doing it that way. And, you know, I would go to Kevin and, and, and Mike Handler, whoever the right people is, you know, Kevin and Lynn would explain that to us. But, you know, I assume we'll need to have somebody to say, yes, this is keeping with the town's game plan to open up. Um, the other thing that I've that I'm thinking about, and I've said to Lynn is, you know, we need to continue to think creatively. And one of my ideas to Lynn is to be reaching out to, you know, there's this informal group, Lynn, of town planners within Fairfield County. So, you know, you, I assume you'll be uh, reaching out to them and sort of brainstorming, you know, what are, you know, what should we be doing? What are some of the opportunities? Um, the other idea is we reach out to Glenn Calder in particular. So we've said to Bloom and Gelderman, keep us in the loop as to what other towns are doing. I think we should also be reaching out to Glenn and saying to Glenn, you know, you're, you're talking to all these different towns. What are they doing? So what do you all think? Throw a bunch of stuff at you. I, I think it's uh, headed in the right direction. And uh, you've got a lot of good specifics. I think we also might want to, or would want to, I think, look at our regulations relative to uh, retail uh, properties in town and to look what, where, where can we relieve uh, the applicants uh, from some of the, the restrictions we have in some of them. For example, one example I'm thinking of is uh, advertising, uh, to allow freer advertising in our newspapers for these people. They can help them and people do that normally and, and we really restrict that. Anybody else? I think we have to be really careful. I, I like the idea of being able to put a, a time limit on the special permits because I think that keeps us from doing something that we might regret later, which I think is a big issue here. So we have to be a little bit careful that down the road we don't get kicked to, uh, back about this so it doesn't create a real problem. Yeah. With the precedent. Yeah, it's John yeah. Pruitt. Uh, I think the idea of a sunset provision on special permits is something that's well worth looking into. Uh, it can be a bit of an experiment. You know, we're not sure really how something may work out. You don't know, you actually have done it. And so a, a temporary special permit may be a way of doing that. I think you want to do it judiciously. And I, I don't think we want to, I would be, I would be cautious about making, um, wholesale changes uh, with, the, with the concern that they may be the camel's nose under the tent and that we end up someplace we didn't really want to end up while uh, attempting to do something good. But it, it sounds like some special hearings to gain public input, um, which would include TDAC, would include the First Selectman's Office and others in town government to get the sense of, you know, here's our um, plans of reopening uh, what uh, role can planning and zoning play into in assisting that reopening and preserving the fabric of the town, particularly the business fabric of the town, which I think is a, a key draw that people have here. And I think we want to make any reasonable efforts to preserve that. I think it also could turn out that what we perceive to be a a problem that could come up may not be the problem that we're faced with. So I, I think it's important to find out what people are, real, are the real concerns once things start to open before we jump in too deep. Yeah, I think uh, this is Dan, to that point, I think uh, it's, it's 
uh, fruitful and optimistic to think that we have to streamline the permitting approval process. But given the, the, the economics of the, of the world today, I think the, the number of applications we're gonna see coming in for modifications of construction, whether it be in town or on residential properties is gonna, is gonna thin out very quickly if, if it hasn't already. And will be it'll be a, a while before it comes back to being a, a backlog issue. Yeah, but I, th I, I that that's th I think that could very well be true. But I think we need to be ready nonetheless. Oh no no agreed agreed. Yeah. Anybody else? Ken. Ken Turner, um, you know John, I um, totally agree with um, what everybody is saying. It's um, you know I think it's imperative to find a way to move forward very quickly, streamline things. Uh, you know, the idea of having additional meetings, uh, I think is a very good idea to help speed up the process. Um, I'd like to maybe better understand or uh, the dialogue that um, is going on about <clears throat> these ideas. Uh, are you thinking of a subcommittee? Um, what, uh, what, what is gonna be the format to have these discussions? Uh, to answer your question, I don't have any firm answer or guidance for you. It's more at this point in my mind, it's a construct and less operational. Um, but one of the, it, it's a great point. I was sort of assuming, um, you know, there's a certain percent of it, percentage of it is us saying, look, we're going to give more latitude to Lynn than maybe traditionally has ended up on the commission side. And I thought I had, we had an interesting discussion with Ira and Pete, and we sort of talked about, you know, where do we stand, for example, talking about site plans, how much site plan flow ends up on our desk versus doesn't end up on our desk. How do we compare to other towns? And Ira and Pete sort of said we were in the middle. Um, so from that respect, I was thinking that we would give her more latitude her first next step in making those decisions I said earlier is to me, but maybe what we do is um, maybe we think about some sort of, op you know, some sort of construct where it's not just going to me. Uh, you know, I, I have no need to be making all these decisions just on my side. So you know, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, so beyond that, I don't have any other brilliant, you know, next steps for you yet. Well, thank you for the uh, information. The other kind of word of caution, um, you know, I, I do think we need to have time limits on, um, you know, this kind of relief on these conditions. And, um, you know, I think we have to watch or, or be very careful because I, I believe that most of the institutions, they are suffering, there's no question about it. But, um, um, you know, the what if uh, they suddenly come forward with um, <clears throat> so many of the conditions, so many of the things that we spent so many years trying to create a quality environment um, and allow them to succeed in their business. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, what potentially could be coming forward and how we might um, understand it if it's uh, if, if it, it really is a financial hardship or a survival type of hardship. Um, and I, I don't have, have a clue how we um, under, undertake that, but I think it deserves further discussion. Yeah, I, you know, I, I do think that, so what is their potential for, um, abuse is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. And, you know, we look at at the federal level right now where we, you know, look at all these loans that are going to certain places that shouldn't be taking these loans, you know, and that's, it's, that's an analogy. Um, you know, that said, knowing that I've got, let's say a six month limitation or whatever that limitation is, and this is just me as one person, my gut is probably going to be more for lat more latitude than less latitude just thinking and seeing just, you know, what this pandemic has done to us economically and psychologically, so. Absolutely, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Krista? 
I was just going to add, um, I mean, I think these are all great ideas that you brought up. And I think that probably the right place for us to focus is on processes that we can change or relax in order to expedite what's going through. Um, I just wonder, I mean, it sounds like you had a conversation with town council. I'm just curious if we could, if we could or should do anything more formal, like um, have them review the process section of our regulations and tell us specifically where we could loosen up based on, you know, state enabling legislation versus what we have in there, just so we know, you know, what our options are. We may not want to use them, but just to have that in our back pocket. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good idea. I was, and, and I don't want this to sound wrong, the wrong, to be taken the wrong way, is when we had our conversation with them. One, I was a little surprised, um, you know, they hadn't heard from other towns on these issues, and I want to ask Kevin in a moment to, to, to jump in here, too. But, you know, we didn't get a lot of firm direction just to, yeah, but, you know, we could, maybe we do go back to them and we say, look, take another look at the code. And I think to that point, um, that's another reason why I think we also ought to go to uh, Glenn Chowder. And, uh, you know, Glenn, as you know, um, to a fair amount, of, to a fair extent, has written our regulations, obviously not officially, um, but he knows our regulations extremely well, too. And so I think that's another avenue to do, to your point. Agreed. Kevin, um, any thoughts on this discussion as well as um, any guidance you can give us um, as to, um, you know, pace of opening, anything like that? I, I know it's a touchy subject, but anything you can relate to us think about this? Well, on the pace, you know, we have two doctors in Harrison Pierce and David Reed and then our health director, Jen Allison, and uh, Mike Handler, we all sort of have to agree on where we're going. And uh, the, uh, we still have a very conservative point of view about, about going slow and waiting to see how this data comes out as far as the hospitals, the, the decline in hospitalization, et cetera. But we're, we're also largely driven by what the governor is gonna do. So, um, you know, there's talk maybe uh, He'll do something in the next seven to ten days with respect to retail or something, uh, and not wait till May twentieth. Um, so we're actively looking at that in terms of you know what we can do. I'm I'm actually working together with three other first selectmen to try to persuade the governor on on a few things that um, uh, I think there's a, a large sentiment that um, some businesses are not going to come back if we don't get back into action. I would also mention that I think uh, I've heard, for example, you know, when you have an institutional use like the Glass House, the Glass House is going to lose their summer party in June, which is a large part of their fundraising uh, and their fiscal year is June 30th. So they really are very precarious. Um, and if they were um, to try to uh, go back into business on a basis that they wouldn't use vans, which are necessarily get people close together, but have people park at the West School parking lot. Um, whether you'd be whether you'd be amenable to that kind of temporary one summer relief to be able to get them back into business when they are going to really struggle um, financially because of the loss unless they're able to, to do the summer party at the end of the summer. Um, but anyway, we're actively working. I've also um, encouraged Tucker Murphy to create a, a committee with Bill uh, Walbert that's going to meet beginning tomorrow about 15 landlords and uh, uh, restaurateurs and uh, merchants downtown to advise the town what we could do as a town or what people could do as citizens to try to help businesses survive downtown. Um, so we're gonna begin that process tomorrow. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Um, let's move on then to back to item number four, planning subcommittee, possible May meeting, um, Chris Denlin. Chris, if you want to go first, as chair, or? I don't really have much to say other than maybe we want to have a meeting in May. <laughs> I feel like the title kind of summarized it. 
so we we were thinking since this is going to be ongoing for a while that um, we kind of suspended the um, subcommittees meetings that maybe we want to have a subcommittee meeting either start at 6 p.m. on the night of our uh, of our scheduled meetings or if we want to start if we have a light agenda like tonight if we want to start at 7 p.m. and have a subcommittee meeting as the first 45 minutes or so of the meeting or hour of the meeting. Um, so any thoughts on that? Um, well, I was actually, I'd, I'll ask the commissioners a question, which is given that um, we're all stuck at home, um, commission meetings used to start at 6.30, right, Jane? And well, that, that was one of the times I remember. I also remember 8 o'clock, which was brutal. Oh. Well, what I was going to suggest was um, actually starting the meetings earlier if, you know, if no one is, for, for the time being, taking Metro North to work. So I was thinking about going the other way, um, but uh, feel free to put it, your, your input there. Um, so would, will we aim to have a, a meeting next month? Subcommittee? Yes. We can, we can prepare material, yes. Yes, okay. I think it seems reasonable. Okay. Um, because I, I do think, um, you know, I'd like to, personally, I'd like to see the subcommittee get going up again, you know, get going again as quickly as possible. Um, and I think we, you know, in addition to the overall review of the regulations, I, I think, you, you, Christy, your subcommittee was, you know, taking up um, some more timely issues as well, you know, in terms of specific, you um, items within the regulations um and then as you well know is the issue of senior housing and um you know i think that's something that um we should be talking about as well now that waveney has withdrawn their application um and you know and I've, I've said this to krista is you know my view is dealing with senior housing is in my view is best done at um, you know, at the level of Chris's subcommittee. So um, that's something that I, I think we, we need to get going on. I think that's true because I think we can have an interaction with various agencies. Gene, Gene Grzecki, say that one more time. Your video went out. Oh, I think that's a good idea because uh, at that level we can have, and we have no application in front of us, we can have some discussions with some of the agencies that would be actively involved. We have an open window now because there's no application. You never know when we won't come back. We need to take advantage of it while it's there. Right. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, let's keep moving. Uh, item number eight. Uh, Lynn, we don't have any administrative actions, do we? We don't. Okay. Item number seven, that was item number six, did I say eight? Anyway, item number seven, approval of the minutes, uh, March 31st, uh, 2020. I did have a question um, in the minutes, and I don't have them in front of me because I'm afraid if I pull them up on the screen, then I'll lose the video meeting. I can share, I can share the screen if you well, want. To. Well, let me just, yeah, actually, why don't you do that? That's a good idea. Because okay. this actually is an important, is, is, is an issue. And uh, go to the approval for the library, please, Lynn. Um, oh, I didn't, you know what? I don't think I put them up. Hold on one second. I, it, you know what? You don't have to. Don't worry about it. Let's just keep going. Oh, okay. So the condition was um, that it would be up for one year for construction. And I thought what we said was the earliest of that of one of either of those but does the way it reads right now it's not the earliest it's just one or the other does does anybody remember how we came out on that I, john it's kent i thought we said uh, the earliest i did too that's anybody? my recollection too okay so yeah. lynn if you can fix that in the minutes please and then um also lynn in the administrative actions we talked about 36 pine um, yep. and the general gist was talked about 36 pine and then inserted into the minutes was 
a, a, a blurb having to do with the recovery discussion, which I brought up after 36 Pine. And then after that, it talks about taking the vote for 36 Pine. So you, you just have a, the flow there as well. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll adjust it. Okay. Um, anybody else on the minutes? Okay. Do I have a motion for approval of the minutes? So moved. I have a second. Okay. I saw Mr. Turner. I technically have to do a roll call. John Goodwin, yay. Gene Grzlecki. Yes. Jack Flynn. Yes. Dan Radman. Yes. Kent Turner. Yes. John Chris. Yes. Krista Nielsen. Yes. Bill Williams. Yes. Okay, great. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Okay, everybody be safe. Take care. Good job. Thank you.